Hello and welcome to another video at overclockersclub.com. This is our YouTube channel and today I'm going to talk about the memory I received from Corsair. It's not a promotional video or anything but they gave me memory to review. I have the Dominator Platinum RGB White Edition. So it's the same as the black but it's the white memory. And they sent me a 3200 kit so and it's 32 gigabytes so 16 gigs for each stick. So they're dual rank. And what we're going to do here today is we're gonna see how far we can push this memory. Usually stock voltages, you can go above that and you wanna see how far we move the memory. So really you're kinda of talking about getting the most money or most bang out of your buck. Memory clocking, is, overclocking is something that is very challenging to do, I believe. It's not something that's automated. You have to really spend days poking at it. So it's not really meant for everybody to do, but for those that really wanna know how far they can push it, we're gonna talk about this in the video. We're gonna cover just the memory itself, the stock speeds and how it looks and how it performs, you know, if it's a good value to you. Obviously, the Dominator Platinum are the premium models. You can get Vengeance or you can get other brands that are a little bit cheaper. You're paying for the looks, you're paying for RGB lighting, and I guess you're also paying for Corsair's service. So if you have issues, RMA service for Corsair has always been good to me, personally. Um, so sometimes when you're paying for memory or paying for a brand, you're paying for the services they provide on top of the product they sell. But before we get started, I want to talk about voltages I'm using and what is safe and what's not safe. I know a lot of people have different ideas what safe voltages are. And of course you can skip ahead in the timeline. I'll put a link down there what time we're going to. But basically, short version is I like to keep my memory at 1.5 volt maximum. You can go higher than that for short term. I think it's just gonna damage your memory um, in a long term or suddenly you're gonna have stability issues and you don't know why. So overall, I don't raise my memory above 1.5 volts and that's for the Samsung BDI memory. If you have a Hynex or if you have Micron, you're gonna have other voltages limits but 1.5 seems to be kind of a safe haven for all of them. Pretty much, if the memory is certified for that speed, the XM profile, XMP profile should get you to there. But there's a caveat to that because Ryzen has issues with high speed memory. And it's not just Ryzen, it's every platform, but Ryzen in particular, you know, they've always been behind on memory speeds, especially when it comes to their memory controller that handles the memory. Uh, so now, Ryzen platform your memory, which is I'm testing today, your memory is tied to the, it should be tied to your F-clock and your F-clock is the Infinity Fabric and that's kind of the go-to component that talks to CP cores and all that stuff. So I wrote an article on it, you can look at the link down below, but really the short version is you wanna have your F-clock matching your memory speed. So if your memory is 3800, you want your F-clock at 1900. If your memory is 3600, you want your F-clock at 1800. I don't raise my voltage for SOC above 1.125 and I don't raise my DRAM voltage above 1.5. So with those parameters, we're gonna see how far I can push this memory, see how far it can go. And then we're gonna see, leaving at stock speeds of 3200, we're gonna see how low I can go on the timings to tune it. So tighten up the timings without changing the voltage and then we'll try it with changing the voltage because some people don't want to mess around with voltages. That's great. We'll see what we can do about that. All right, so we're going to see how high we can go. So if I just do auto, it kicks in auto. Complete auto is fine for people that want to just plug in the computer and go. If you're trying to actually benchmark stuff and see if things are faster or slower, you have to tune the settings up, so. Let's see if we can get 3800 out of this. All right, so it failed to boot, obviously. Um, this is what happens when uh, you, 07 basically means there's a memory issue, whether it's voltage, timings, or anything else. 07 is almost 99% related to memory. Um, 22 also is a memory issue for, at least for uh, ACU boards, the Q codes. So they're stuck, so let's go ahead and restart the power. So first up for our graphs, we're gonna look at 
how the memory performed as far as stock speeds and what I was able to overclock it to. So it's no surprise that stock speeds, it, it ran, it passed MM test 86, had no problems in Windows, and of course all the benchmarks work. 3200 with a bit of uh, timing shortened to CL15, it passed also. And then at 3600, it passed with a little bit looser in the timings. 3733, while it has worked in the past, I was usually only able to boot into Windows, but often it would fail uh, benchmarks or it would fail memtest 86 and then 3800 wouldn't boot at all for the Corsair memory now the other issue I had is that memory does not like to be overclocked so 1.35 volt was the highest I could go for voltage and therefore I couldn't overclock it as far as I wanted to even with loose timings I still wasn't able to boot at 3800 in comparison the G scale memory that's rated for 3733 was able to get to 3800 about issues. So it's not the motherboard or the CPU, it's the memory itself. So we're looking at the Blender chart here, and as you see, all the render times are about the same 2 minutes and 34 seconds, 2 minutes and 34, 45 seconds. It's all about the same. Uh, so increasing memory speed does not affect 3D rendering, especially in Blender. Let's move on to Adobe Premiere. Adobe Premiere has added functions for video encoding, so the CPU may no longer be a big asset in encoding video, though it's very useful when it comes to adding effects, and not all programs play nice with GP rendering. There is a benefit to faster feed memory to a point, but really the tuned memory was the best, and if you look at the charts, you're looking at only about a 15 second difference between the fastest and the slowest memory. So really more memory is appropriate for video editing. Faster memory can help, but usually more memory is the better option. Next up is POV Ray. I don't use this program. I don't know much about it, but if you look at the scores, they're pretty similar across all the memories. So let's move on from there. Geekbench is something that people like to use to compare between Mac and PC or laptops or what have you. This is basically multi-core bandwidth. So it's uh, the lowest speed, which is our stock memory. So it's 40 gigabytes per second. The fastest tuned memory is 46.5 gigabytes. This is not really uh, helpful for software, but at least gives you an idea that the memory frequency can affect how much bandwidth you actually are able to get. So last up is your gaming benchmark. Now, this is a special graph because this is representing your frame rate when it's tied to the CPU. So I wrote an article on this, but the short version is that if you play the lowest graphical settings and the lowest uh, resolution you can go at, then you become CPU bound and therefore when you have higher frequency memory it helps you achieve higher frame rate. Now once you actually start playing at a resolution that matters for people playing games, so that if you're playing at 4k resolution or anything with max settings, then you start seeing that memory frequency does not make a difference as indicated in the orange slice there. That is all the same frame rate that's about 40 frames per second so almost all the games reach the same frame rate when you're maxed out on the settings because you're GPU bound and not CPU bound. Alright so we did all that testing and as you see the memory taps out at about 3800. Now it does pass memtest 86 um, but I don't understand why it fails to boot into Windows or if it does boot into Windows and it fails at a 64, which is a really relatively light benchmark on memory, I think. So with those two com combinations together, I know it passed memtest, but it failed that. I don't think it's stable 300. Um, it could be partly due to my system setup, but you know, even one stick in there, it still had a hard time booting. And then of course, when I used the G-Skill memory, I had no problem getting to 3800 with the same timings. It ran flawlessly. So what is the conclusion here? So if you are buying this memory uh, for the purpose of what it's sold for, which is 3200, you're not going to have any issues. You're going to plug it in, it's going to boot, and then you're going to enjoy 32 gigs of memory. And also you're going to kind of enjoy the white look to it, which is really the part of the premium price you're paying for the look of the memory, whether you want the black or white version. And then you're going to pay for the lighting scheme, which is the Caterpillar lights or whatever they want to call it. Um, so that has its own appeal. Now, I will say the downside of the lighting is that they're missing two LEDs. It's not like they didn't, I didn't get a kit that has broken LEDs. It's just that 
they have 12 adjustable LEDs. I think they need 14 because in the middle of where the memory is or where the Domineer logo is, I feel like from the top it looks great, but then from the sides you can kind of see the dimness to it. So it kind of gives me the feeling that it's just two lights are missing on it. And it's kind of, it's weird to me. I don't think many memory kits when it's installed on computers, you're gonna see from the side. So it's kind of a weird instance where you're only looking at it from the side if you're looking for it. Most people have a computer case set up, they're not looking at the memory from the side, or if you have four sticks of memory, um, you're all of them next to each other, so you're not gonna be able, to, you're not gonna see the light bleed issue there, or lack of light bleed, or just lack of light, I mean. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. So, the lack of lighting on the side kind of bugged me in that one, but the memory does run at stock speeds just fine. So the weird issue I ran into is that this memory really does not like increase in voltage. I've never come across a memory kit, especially when the Samsung die, die memory, uh, it, it wouldn't handle 1.4 volt or above. So 1.4, 1.45, 1.5, 5, all out of the question which means you really couldn't lower the timings at stock 3200. So usually if you want lower timings, which is kind of tightened, tightened up, you can increase the voltage and then you can just get tighter timings on that. Or the opposite happens if you want to get higher speed memory, if you want to go to 3600, 3800, whatever you want, speed increase you want, more voltage tends to help, especially if you want to keep the same timings, but also have increased frequency. Not a grain of salt, but take that into consideration when buying memory is that fast memory is good in several applications. It doesn't make a difference in most gaming, honestly. Uh, this is for Ryzen, of course. Intel has a different kind of setup, but I suspect the same idea, oh, same principle applies to this. Uh, once you become GPU bound, which is the video card, is the limitation, not the CPU, then you start running into issues where the memory doesn't actually make a difference in speed. All right, so we're gonna check out the memory setup for Corsair. Corsair has something called the IQ, which is their software for controlling their peripherals, their lighting, anything to do with Corsair, it works through here. And of course, you can do the motherboard. And I paused for a second because I found that the motherboard is finicky sometimes, so you can change it and it will change, but I found that the case, for some reason my case, on the five volt header, which is this one right here, doesn't respond to the case at all. That being said, we're not talking about the motherboard today, we're talking about the memory, so let's go ahead and jump on some memory. And the interesting thing about the memory is, depending on how you set up it, it allows you to pick a whole slew of different options. So our setup is gonna be this. And you can pop them around. And then you have, we'll skip lighting for now, you have timings, this tells me what the memory is actually running at right now, so. This is obviously the black version of the memory. I think maybe if they have an update, they might allow you to pick the, between the two versions. Corsair rep told me that they are identical. So the only thing different between the two is going to be uh, the actual casing on it. So if you're buying memory, the memory sticks themselves are identical. So here's the graph and it shows us basically the temperature and how hot it gets. So if you were to run a benchmark, you can see in real time pretty much the temperature of the memory if you are interested in that. Chips themselves are rated for like 80 Celsius if you ever look up the part number. So if they're sitting at 37, I don't know if the 37 for just the PCB or if they're doing temperature for one chip or what, I don't know where the sensor is sitting. Under lighting, you have a whole slew of options. You can just do default and let it rainbow itself out. And I did notice, if you saw the delay, uh, there is no apply button. So the only way the lighting or any of that stuff actually works, um, when you click off of it, it, it kicks in. There's so many options in here that I, I really haven't gone through it. You can somehow connect it to your case, I believe. Oh, there it goes. So my case is glowing with uh, memory itself, or I guess to say the CPU cooler and the motherboard is. Uh, the actual case doesn't change color as I talked about already. Something to do with the software or motherboard or whatever. It's hard to see in the picture, the video, but uh, if you look really close, I'll put my finger here, 
you can see there's a dim spot there and there's a dim spot there but you might be able to pick it up on the video it's, a, it's dimmer it's noticeably different so if you go multicolor this is cool you can actually turn off each light individually if you want so as you can see, this software has a lot to be desired as far as like layout goes. I've, I've definitely been able to click on each light individually and turn them on and off, but um, there is not, it doesn't really stand out to me how to do it now. All right, so that's really the memory for this, for the Corsair memory. I do know you can turn lights on and off. Once again, I can't figure out how to turn them on and off. All right, so we have the Dominator Platinum memory, and uh, hopefully we can do a video about taking this apart. Um, it's gonna be a little bit challenging, so let's go ahead and maybe zoom in a little bit, see if we can get a little bit of a better view. So this is what I was talking about. You can can't really see in the video, but between here and here, there's only two lights for the top. And to me, I know I'm making a big issue out of it, to me that's uh, a bit of annoyance because I, I kind of want all lights across the whole top and all across the side. So we're going to take this part and see what kind of memory it is. I did look online and also in the program you can find out it tells me it's Samsung B die memory. But, um, you know, test we must verify. So I'm using the Torque. I went through my whole kit and I found one that fits uh, uh, let's see here what and this says it's torque 6h so i don't know if that helps anybody in the future no it's loose it's coming out okay wow so these are really long very easy to lift screws And so one side is the screw and one side is the pin. So that's the issue. This side, you have to hold it with your finger. Otherwise the screw just goes forever. Yeah, sorry. All right, so it's a little bit crooked. I can't do anything about this because I don't really have a space for recording. Um, so we can take it off the top here. And it seems to be little lip there to hold it in place. So once again, interesting that each one of these correlates to a single light, but then this bar, this big piece of plastic only has two LEDs below it, but yet it acts like it's, it should have more. So now I don't suggest doing this at home because there's no reason to take your memory apart. All right. Seems like the connector for the LEDs on the other side. So this side is going to be the barcode side. This is your Corsair memory. Uh, it looks like the A2 layout. So when it's A2 means the chips are farther apart, and then this meant for higher frequency. Uh, they're not great on timings, but it's better for higher frequency. Interesting that they use the A2 layout for memory that's 3200, but I think maybe A0 and all that layouts are kind of extinct. To lift. Oh. oh, there it goes. Okay, so I lifted it up. Here you go. It's just a piece of metal, and then glued to that piece of metal is all the little LEDs right here. And, uh,. They're glued together, so you really can't take this part apart. I mean, I guess you can, but it's not really letting me do that. Interesting. Um, so the memory itself, if we compare it to, I don't know, what's, do I have some Corsair? No, I do. I have the, if we compare it to the Vengeance Pro, which I know I peeled off one of these. And the thing about these is this, you can tell that this is not a real stick, it's the fake memory. Okay. Well, we're just gonna ruin this one. Once again, I don't recommend doing this unless you really don't care about your memory. Once again, this is not real memory, so it doesn't matter. All 
All right, so that's how flimsy that is. I just bent and dented it. But the LEDs, each one of the LEDs is actually part of the board. And then if you look at memory, it doesn't have any LEDs at all. Let's go ahead and peel this guy off. It's really hard to tell which memory I peeled before. There, I believe I peeled these apart before. So. So you can tell these are both A2 layouts. And as far as height goes, they're gonna be the same height. Um, actually, I lied, these are a little bit shorter in height. This is a 4400K I just peeled apart. And the part number looks like W05WBBCPB. I'll put the number in the video. And these are a different part number. 5WC8CTD. These ones right here, even though they're 4400 megahertz, they are the lowest bin kit. So they are, they run at 80 Celsius, they don't take high voltage. So what Patriot did is they bought a bunch of chips from Samsung and then just kind of tested all of them and see which one actually rocked the most. That's how they did this. I believe if I look up the part number here, it'll tell me that this memory is actually rated for higher speeds and higher um, temperature. Which makes sense because uh, you have LEDs on here, you have a 10 layer PCB I believe, and uh, this is supposed to help with uh, temperature, supposedly. I don't know how much true that is, but you, you think about it, the LEDs, it's a lot of work. So this is the LED chips and all that, that's the ones that power the LEDs. This doesn't have any LEDs, so therefore it has nothing up there. And then the fake memory, which is vengeance memory, you would have memory sticks right here, but same thing principle applies. Instead of having memory sticks right here, you still have the same controllers up top. And actually, they're probably the same part number. Anyways, that concludes taking apart the memory. Um, we already covered everything else, I think. Well, it depends on how I chop the video up, but we covered everything else, so let's move on. Okay guys, I know I had a lot of things to talk about in this video. I hope it makes sense. I hope you consider buying Corsair's Dominator memory. Uh, I'm not a fan of giving awards or stars or whatever um, because in every application, memory and also any product has its place. So right now, Corsair asked for a premium for their Dominator white memory because Honestly, it's the only type of memory that looks like this. You can't buy any other memory that has this look to it. You want white, you want the little gold look, accent to it, and you want the little caterpillar lighting to it, you have to buy this memory. There's no other competition. If you want RGB lighting and you're not a super fan of the kind of caterpillar look to it, then you can buy anything else. If you don't really care about customization in the software, because of course it does a really good job at their lighting software, honestly, compared to other people, um, you have to buy Corsair. So it kind of depends on what you want out of the memory. So I feel like this memory is great, a great product for what it is. Buy it if you want the speeds it comes at. It's not great for overclocking. I didn't ever expect it, ever expect it to be great for overclocking because it is kind of, when you buy lower binned memory, overclocking it, tends to be less likely because they take their higher bin memory and sell it for a higher kit. Some companies will take all the memory and it's all bin high and they put it across all their different kits. Other companies, they, you know, they're checking the memory to see if it can handle that speed and if they can't, then they bin it lower. So you're buying memory that is completely stable at the speed they say, but of course it will change and it'll vary based on how fast you're trying to push it or actually how tight the timings are going. So thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe. Make sure to keep a lookout for other things that Overclockers Clubs is doing, especially Chris is always putting new videos out for cases. And go on our website, check out the articles written, because while we talk about videos, sometimes the articles are in more in depth or just different altogether because we can't cover all the conversations on video as we can with written 